Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to do a little bit of talking, but mostly uh, you're going to be hearing from some of my students uh, who have been involved in this ongoing research project in Hong Kong that's now finishing its fourth year of uh, research. Uh, it's actually one of my classes here. Uh, and I want to show you, I became a father uh, about seven weeks ago. And I'm showing you this picture because I know everybody loves babies. And then maybe now I'll win the best presenter award. You'll just have to see this is my baby. Um, no, but actually, uh, there's some significance to him. And if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll come back to my baby. You know, I'll explain you why, why he's here. Uh, this is a slide that I last showed uh, way back on the 22nd of September, 2010, at my confirmation seminar. Uh, I, been, uh, I spent about three months uh, at another school, uh, starting to do a little bit of ethnographic work. And at that time I was saying, I, I want to have this critical pedagogy in Hong Kong. And it's going to mean some of these things. That I'm working with students uh, to help them build a critique of their own social position. And I want to help students understand their own position in the schools so that they can have some power uh, to transform their own agency. Right? So they can have some control over what's happening to them in the school. So that school is not something that happens to them. It's something that they really become actively involved in, in shaping for, for themselves. Um, and I was really thinking about something that built community, uh, built hope, and built a critical consciousness. Uh, a strong subjectivity that's really aware of the historical moment that you're in. Okay, so you can start to shape history instead of history just happening to you. So some pretty lofty, uh, pretty lofty ideals. Uh, after September 2010, I spent a year at a school doing ethnographic work uh, and also doing some co-teaching in liberal studies. Uh, but I ended up at the school where I am now, uh, and I, I'm finishing up my second academic year teaching there, and sort of, I kept just extending the research, extending the research, because a critical pedagogy, and when you're working to sort of transform oppressive conditions, it's never done. It's always ongoing, and so I thought, the more that I can work, the, the better a research report that I can, I can produce. I'll show you a little bit more progress. Uh, but in my time in Hong Kong, there's been two narratives about ethnic minorities in Hong Kong, and ethnic minorities in education, two stories that keeps being repeated over and over again, including by a lot of people here at, at this uh, fine institution. The first is the narrative of uh, the struggles of ethnic minorities. Uh, so here is, um, I'll read a lot of quotes, drug pushers get the ethnic minority teenagers to sell drugs in local schools because if they're caught, they won't be sent to prison for life. They'll go to juvenile detention, said a local manager at an organization that works with ethnic minorities. Less than 1% of ethnic minority students get into tertiary education. So they lose heart and they just want to make money. And so we see this over and over again uh, in the Hong Kong media. And also just you know, teachers kind of tell the story. The community itself tells the story. And then the other narrative, the other story that we hear over and over again, is that, well, the problem of education for ethnic, ethnic minorities is that they're not learning Chinese well enough. This is the problem. Okay? And so this one talks about um, uh, South Asian students thwarted by a lack of Chinese language skills, and then it sort of repeats the same, uh, some of the same figures about um, students kind of dropping out, not, not only before they get to tertiary, but somewhere at the secondary level. And this, this story, this narrative, extends itself internationally. So even the New York Times is reporting, uh, because of the poor quality of education in these schools, uh, ethnic minority students end up not being able to read and write Chinese. Their inability to learn the language affects their education opportunities and subsequently their employment. Okay, so this is what I kept hearing and kept hearing, but my work in the school really was showing me something very different. Uh, that it's not only ethnic minority students, but also Chinese, ethnic Chinese students from working class families that are really caught in some highly repressive schools. Um, where the logic of the school is run by administration systems that don't allow any other opportunities uh, or alternative edu educational views to kind of emerge. Uh, and so the administration gets caught up in that, the teachers get caught up in that, the students get caught up in that. Okay, so the narrative that I want to start pushing out is that it's not an issue of uh, Chinese students not learning Chinese. It's an issue of 
an oppressive education system that's keeping students from education. Okay. Of course, we could uh, teach Chinese language better, but these students are also failing math, they're also failing science, and they're not gaining academic literacy in any language, including English. Uh, and sometimes, uh, some of the work that we do is to try to counter these narratives. Okay, so here's uh, a draft of some writing that we did in class. Um, actually, this is the final draft, so this has been edited probably two or three times. Uh, in response to the first article I showed you. I live in Jordan, and I think this article is true enough, but not to all Lebanese people in Jordan. In this article, the writer is only giving a